So I am Karen Benner from the Lucy Robbins Wells Library. Um, I'm hosting tonight's program along with Jen Hebert, who also works at the library. Uh, welcome to the virtual wine tasting program with John Haight. Uh, John has worked as a wine retailer, a consultant, and also a wine journalist. Um, he's he is a certified Spanish wine educator and has traveled to many of the world's greatest wine producing regions. John is also a retired public school teacher. Um, he currently runs an educational tasting series at a local wine company. Um, he also conducts wine classes at various locations. Um, John, would you like to hop in and add anything else about your background? Yes. I, uh, first off, so thank you for inviting me and thank you for all coming out to, uh, for tonight. So uh, it's nice to meet you all. And uh, yeah, I've been in the wine business on and off in different capacities for 25, 30 years, uh, doing different things. And over the course of time, working in a shop, you start doing a tasting here and there. And the next thing I knew, I said, gee, you know, maybe I could do this as part of a job. And so I now have a one-man business called WineUnwrapped.com. And that's my website. And I do these sorts of tastings. Uh, I used to do them in person, but uh, not so much lately. Uh, but I have many different jobs. I've I, I did teach wine appreciation at the University of New Haven for a while. I did a, a stint at uh, Gateway College teaching wine service. They had a program for people to get into the restaurant business, and I did the wine part of it. And I work with Jones Winery. I just work in the wine field, basically, these days. And, uh, so who, who could have a better job than that? But anyways, let's, let's kick things right off. If, if any of you have any wine, if you haven't opened it up, open it up. If you have your glass ready, pour a glass. Uh, what I want to start with is just talking about basically tasting like a professional. And uh, many people think, well, you don't have to tell me how to drink wine. Well, what I want to try to do is just show you some ways to maybe get a little bit more out of it. So one of the first things that people do is they take a good look at it. I tilt it a little. I try to look at it against the white background. And I have that behind me, in front of me, as you can see. And uh, so I've got the Sauvignon Blanc from uh, New Zealand. And this one's called Matua. And, and I know that Sauvignon Blancs don't usually have a whole lot of color. So one of the things I'm looking at, if this had a lot of color, I'd suspect maybe it's been old, it's an older wine or it's been oxidized or anything like that. Uh, I look to see if it's cloudy. Red wines, if it should be a nice bright red or purple. If you see browning, that gives you an idea maybe there's something wrong. But you should always take a good look at it, enjoy the color. And then what I want you to do, if you have a glass, give it a good, give it a good sniff. Now remember, Grapes, when they ferment, compounds are created that you also find in other grapes and other, excuse me, other fruits. And so you will get smells of other things besides grapes. You really often don't get grape smells at all from wine. And so you do that, you might say, oh, I smell a little bit. Now I'm smelling, for this one, I can actually smell a few things like peaches and I can get some herbal and some citrus. But here's the way to really let it open up. Do a swirl. Give it a really good swirl. And then dive in again. And it actually, and what you're basically doing is getting the wine to vaporize and you're getting the vapors and you, you will get a little bit more out of it. And so I can get a little more intensity out of this. I'm smelling more than I got. Now I'm getting a little bit of a grassiness, which is what common in Sauvignon Blanc. Here's the next one. And this is what the pros do. They really do. They trap it. They swirl it, trap it, and then stick your nose in. Now the wine that I have is Sauvignon Blanc. That's a very aromatic grape. And you don't have to work too hard with it. But uh, uh, Pinot Gris, often Pinot Grigio, can often have to take a, a little bit of work to get it to smell. Some, some grapes don't have as much uh, aroma as, as you'd like. So you sometimes have to work at it. So then I'm going to take my first sip. That's not to judge it. I'm just cleaning out my mouth. I had pulled pork a little while ago, <laughs> kind of getting that out of my mouth. I did have to, I cheated. I had to melt back with that too, a little bit of that. So. But now I'm going to take a real sip. Now watch, watch what I do with my mouth. I know it looks silly, but if you can get the wine on all parts of your mouth, get it in the back of your throat, your cheeks, you know, you taste receptors, not just on your tongue. So you're trying to reach that all over the place. And if you do that and then pause, don't say anything like I did right off. I just I swallowed. Let yourself savor it for just a bit. You can really see that you taste a lot more different flavors. You start getting some of the things that you smelled, you'll see that in the flavor. But you can keep tasting. I'm still tasting the wine. 
and uh, it, that's called the finish. And wines that have a, a long finish, I appreciate that. And so as you taste, give it a good, good swirl, give it a sniff. Uh, you don't have to go crazy and do the mouthwash routine every sip, but it's good to do it on the first sip or so. If you have food that goes, you know, you're gonna have with it, it's always good to taste the wine and go to the food and come back to the wine and see how they match up together. So the first grape that we have is Sauvignon Blanc. It's a grape, actually all three of these grapes originated in France. And this was a, a grape that you see in big in the Loire Valley in uh, Western France, also in Bordeaux. In the Loire Valley is what they call the Pouille Fumé or saint Sears. is another, is across the river on the, on, the, on the opposite bank. And they're very well known for Sauvignon Blancs. Uh, Bordeaux uses it, they blend it, they make dessert wines with it. And, uh, but it's planted all over the world. You, find, you can find it almost in every country. It, it's a grape that will express where it's grown. If it's grown in cool places, it tastes one way. If it's grown in warm places, it gets more tropical. You could almost always tell one from uh, California because you'll get, besides some of the herbal and grassy and, and uh, grapefruit flavors, you get the mangoes and tropical fruit flavors. So depending on where they're grown, it's gonna have different flavors. The, the number one thing that you usually get though from Sauvignon Blanc is citrus. And uh, we're talking now about uh, New Zealand. And New Zealand is fairly cool. It's actually the southernmost wine growing region in the world. And uh, their, their grapes, they're not super, super ripe. So they're gonna have a little more acid. They have a zing, they have a zip. And uh, they, they, they're, they're well known for a grapefruit. They taste like grapefruit. And some of them are so extreme grapefruit, I, it's too much for me. It's like I was drinking something for breakfast. But when you have the, the many different citrus flavors, the limes, the, the, uh, a little tangerine, a little uh, uh, grapefruit together, it makes, a nice, it makes a nice wine. One of the best uh, pairings that I've seen for it is uh, goat cheese. If you like stronger cheeses, saltier cheeses, goat cheese works really well with Sauvignon Blanc. But my ultimate favorite is oysters. So if you like oysters, raw oysters in particular, it's a great, great match. Now this wine is from a, the one that I have is from a company called Matua. I'll hold it up over here. And uh, Matua means uh, senior, the most senior. And I've actually heard several different producers say that they made the first Sauvignon Blanc in New Zealand. And this one does too. <laughs> this one says it's, we were the first ones, we did it first. But I, that claim has been, put out there by several others. So I'm not sure which one is really true, but these guys did start in the 60s and uh, New Zealand doesn't have a real long wine history, but uh, these guys were one of the first, if not the first, and uh, they, they do a very nice job with it. And I don't know if anybody had this, but I'll show you if you can see it. See there's a little snowflake here. This is kind of a gimmick. They put that on there. When you put it in your refrigerator and chill it, the snowflake turns blue. And that tells you it's chilled. If I put my finger here and warm it up, and when I take it away, it won't be warm for long because the wine's cold. You'll see maybe it's faded a little bit in color. So they put a little temperature uh, guide on there. The most famous of all the New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs is called Cloudy Bay. And uh, it's, it's really two to three times the price. But back in the late 70s, they came out and you could only get them in restaurants and it was a big, big splash. Oh, this is the new style of Sauvignon Blanc. And uh, it got to be rare. So. Uh, I don't know if you saw the list of wines that we put out that were, were you, could, you could purchase instead of this one. That Cloudy Bay was the splurge wine, but uh, you ever see that? They're, they're the ones that are like the most well-known of all the uh, Sauvignon Blancs. So with that, I'm going to say if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask me any questions about this particular wine or any wines in general, really, uh, we'll be glad to uh, talk to you about that. We have two other wines that we're going to go through, two different grapes. But feel free to ask about uh, whatever's on your mind. So uh, if you'd like to unmute and uh, participate, and if you have a wine that you want to tell us about or ask about, uh, please, please do. So uh, hit that mute button and, and join us. Anybody have any questions so far? Well, I have one actually. Can you talk about um, sulfites for a minute? Um, and are, are they harmful? Well, if you're allergic to them, they certainly are. Just like if you're allergic to shellfish, you shouldn't, you should avoid them. But only about, some people say a half of 1% to maybe 1% of the world's population is allergic to sulfites. And if that's the case, they should never have sulfites. And I'm so glad that it wasn't me because 
Uh, when you think about all the foods and, and things that we consume that contain sulfites, it's a lot. I mean, dried fruit, the, very, the, you know, the, the record holder for sulfite levels is dried fruits, like dried apricots. They easily have 100 more times sulfite levels than, than you can find in wine. But wow. uh, people see that, that label, and they did. Back, I think it was 1980, somewhere around there, the American government decided to put uh, warning labels on sulfites. So everybody got this idea that, oh my gosh, it's, it's a terrible thing. But, you know, there's, there's more sulfites in a can of cola than there are in a, a bottle of wine. Uh, I was in a supermarket. I saw shrimp. You know what I saw? Contained sulfites right on the, on the label. Uh, sausages, beer, ciders. Uh, it, it's everywhere. It really is. And the sulfites, the Romans knew about sulfur in winemaking many, many years ago. And they found that if they burned elemental sulfur in the barrels, the wines stayed fresher because we take it for granted. Think about our wines. They stay stable. We, we you know, you can put it by a wine and keep it for years and you open it up and it's generally good. But back in the old days, they didn't have wine in, in bottles. They were in big barrels. The wine spoiled so quickly. And the Romans discovered that sulfur compounds could prolong the life of, of wine. And so sulfites, what they do is they kill bacteria and they keep the wine from oxidizing. And that's really what happens with wine. It oxidizes if, once it's opened. So, uh, but if you're, if you haven't, if you can take a taste of wine and, and you don't have the hives and the asthma type things that you get, uh, you're not allergic. Okay. So you really don't need to be, and the government, our government has levels of sulfites that they allow in wine. Other foods are much higher and they don't have any warnings. Huh. So it's, it's huh. kind of, uh, I don't know. Now, is so, there a difference between um, from wines that are purchased in in Europe? I mean, they're not sulfite free, are they? No. The reason that people think that the wines in Europe are different is they did not have a rule that said you had to put a sulfite warning on the label. Uh, so if you shipped it to America, they would have an added uh, label, a little sticker saying contains sulfites. If you went to Europe and bought a bottle of wine, they just never had that regulation. They do now, though. And now, you go, you, you, if you pick up a bottle of wine from, and you go to Europe and get it, it's going to have contained sulfites in like three or four languages. So I think around 2011, they, they started including it. But many people feel, and I've heard people say, you know, oh, gee, you know, I came back from Italy and I could drink wine all day and all night and, and, and I never got a headache. And, yeah. and the sulfites give me a headache. And, 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 you know, there's a couple of myths there. One. Sulfites do not give you headaches. That's not from sulfites. Could be from too much alcohol. It could be from other things. There are other things, but they don't give you the, the headache. And, uh, but when people don't realize, when you're, you go to go on vacation, you go to Italy, you're on vacation, you have a big lunch, you have your wine with it, then you have dinner. In, in Europe, they, they don't just have wine, they have wine with the food. And so when you're on vacation, you're, you're eating with it, you're doing that, you know. And plus, when you're on vacation, you can power through anything. You know, it's <laughs> so. But people, people do have this myth that uh, the wines over there are different than ours. Now, that's not to say that there are not wines uh, that contain no sulfites. You can get sulfite-free wines. However, when wine is produced during fermentation, the uh, natural fermentation causes sulfites to occur in the wine. So there's no wine that's zero sulfites. There's none because it happens during the winemaking process. It's the added sulfites that the winemakers use that, that, that we're really talking about. And there are wines that have no added sulfites. And so uh, winemakers are getting better at it and using less and less and less. So, uh, but the wines in Europe are the same. Thank you. So anybody else have anything uh, you want to mention? I will say quickly about screw caps. You notice this is a wine from the Southern Hemisphere. And it has a, a screw cap. Uh, and some of you might be remember, like I do, back in the day, if you saw a wine with a screw cap, it really was inferior. There is a, there, it was. It truly was. Those days are over. So uh, the screw caps do not mean uh, a low-quality product. Uh, that was going to be my question. <laughs> I'm horrible uncorking it. So I was like, I always go for the screw cap. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, that's fine. Well, there are some good screwdrivers, the screw, screw, cork screws out there. Uh -huh. that, that later on, I can can suggest a few. The waiters one is probably the best. But uh, while we have a second here too, I'm going to mention this. This is a, a book called The Wine Folly, and for anybody that's interested in wine, this is a great 
book for uh, beginners. I use it all the time. I use it pretty much at every tasting I go to. And it takes each grape in each country and tells you a little bit about it. And uh, for instance, it'll say uh, they have flavor reels. And again, I don't know how this is going to show. No, not too bad. But this is Sauvignon Blanc, and they take the Sauvignon Blanc grape and talk about all the different flavors and aromas you could get from that grape. Because a lot of people, when they uh, when they taste wine, they say to me, you know, I like the wine, but I don't know what I'm tasting. Well, basically, you're tasting other fruits. You really are. And uh, when you start learning that Sauvignon Blanc often has you know, grapefruit, citrus, that sort of thing, and you taste a few of them, you start seeing that. But, uh, but this is a great book. If anybody has a chance to pick this up or subscribe to the newsletter, they have a, an email. But a uh, very good book for, uh, for to, to you get your feet wet. And if you really want to go. Down. Thank you, John. And here's another one for the, for the if once you get past the wine folly, get the wine Bible. And this is, it's like a thousand pages. But well, very well written and you can just take it in little pieces. And uh, it really helps you learn more about the wines and the countries and things like that. So we can move on to another wine if you folks are uh, ready for me to start number two. And uh, if again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to, uh, to let me know. So, and since you're being, you're, you know, well, we never gave, did we give people a chance to unmute? I guess we did, but. Uh, yes, yes, we did. Okay. Um, yeah, please feel free to, to uh, unmute. I mean, you can also unmute if you have a question, um, you know, during the program too. It seems, since everybody's so quiet, I don't think we have too many people here that uh, it, it's going to create a problem. So if you want right. to unmute yourself as, as John is talking, John, is that okay with you? Sure. If you start getting rowdy, though, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll start muting you, but, but feel free. All right. Uh, hi, uh, hi, I had a question. Sure. So for the two red wines that we're going to be tasting, should we have opened them beforehand to let them breathe? You know, it's, it, that's a good question. And you can, I don't think it's going to matter in this particular instance. These, these are wines that uh, you can enjoy pretty much right off the bat. Uh, I didn't pick wines that were so uh, intense that they needed to be decanted, let's say, or to have to breathe to, to, to be you know, showing their best. So if you didn't, that, that's not an issue, you know. The reason that you open wines early, and just opening a wine, to be honest with you, if you just open up a wine and, and uh, you know, it's all the way up to the top, think about how much air is actually touching that. There's really not much. So if you really have, have a wine that is a very rough, rugged, young, tannic wine, particularly a red, that's when you want to decant it. You pour it into another uh, container, and that aerates it and that softens it up, it kind of wakes it up a little bit. But I don't think you really need it to with these. So, uh, and again, I do, we'll say, I, quite often I will open up a wine earlier than, than I, before I drink it. But uh, if I really have a wine that I need to aerate, that's when I, I'll decant it. So uh, I'm gonna go to uh, another grape. Now the reason I picked these three grapes is Sauvignon Blanc and particularly the New Zealand ones are so wildly popular now. I thought that they'd be easy to find and, it's something I want to try, and they're really great seafood wines. They're great in the summer. They're just refreshing. They have a high acid level. Malbec is the next wine. It's the next grape, and people uh, have flocked to Malbec in, in droves, and most people are really unaware of what it really is. Malbec is the name of a grape, and again, it originated in France. It's one of the original Bordeaux blending grapes. Again, in Western France is the region of Bordeaux very famous region, and they use grapes Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, uh, Petit Verdot, Malbec, uh, and uh, another grape called Carmenere that grows in Chile. And those are the grapes that are allowed in, in Bordeaux. Malbec ended up being transplanted to Argentina, and it turns out Malbec is a grape that doesn't like the humid, and it's pretty humid in Bordeaux, Argentina. They have like 300 and something days of sun per year. It's very dry. You've got the Andes Mountains blocking the rain, so it's a very dry, dry climate. They get the snow melt from the Andes for irrigation. And so uh, Malbec grows really, really well in Argentina. And uh, at around the 1800s, you had the end of the Spanish rule, and a lot of immigrants came to Argentina. A lot of immigrants were Italian, I'm not quite sure why. 
In fact, they say now, if you go to the town of Mendoza, one of the biggest towns in, in Argentina, it's actually 50% of all the restaurants are Italian restaurants in, in, in Argentina. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of immigration that came in there. Uh, during the 1800s, they started building railroads. And uh, one person that came over to, uh, to Argentina was Edmund Norton. And he was a, a, a railroad bridge builder, that sort of thing. And he fell in love with the country and fell in love with the Mendoza reason, region. And uh, he bought vineyard. He bought land to plant the vineyard. And so what they do is they would bring cuttings from France, the original French cuttings, and plant them in Argentina. And they grew really, really well there. And uh, Mendoza became the big, big uh, grape a big, big grape growing area. If, if you look at a bottle of wine from Argentina, 75% of all wine from Argentina was made in Mendoza. That's how, how, how important it really is. So Malbec is a grape that's a, you know, it's a, it's a good hearty red grape. It can be made in many styles. Uh, when you see the grape in, in your glass, it's, uh, in fact, I'll pour some. And you give it the good look. It's got a purpley red color. If you really look at it and hold your finger with the light, it's not, it's not opaque. It's uh, uh, not, not so dense that you can't see through it. But it's uh, kind of sometimes more what we call a savory wine than a fruity wine. And so when I do the swirl, you know, and I don't get like uh, tropical fruits that I was getting from the, uh, from the Sauvignon Blanc. Now I'm getting all different things. And I get like black currants and dark currants and plum. You can get kind of like an olive uh, smell. You can get a little cocoa from, uh, from, from Malbec. And uh, like I said, I had some of this with pulled pork and uh, I, can, I can vouch for the, uh, the pairing. If you have a little barbecue sauce and a little pulled pork, uh, go for it. But again, you know, the swirl, give it a sniff. Now, if you're on one of the red wines, excuse me, let me try to adjust my iPad. After I swallow, my tongue gets dry. I can feel like a little tug on my tongue. And that's from the tannins. Now, tannins are a compound that you find from the skins, the seeds, the stems, and oak barrels. White wines, the traditional modern white wine, is not made using the skins. It's not made with the stems or the seeds. And many of them are just in stainless steel, so you don't get a lot of tannins. Now, tannin is a compound that you don't taste, but you sense. It's a tactile thing. And this wine was aged in an oak barrel for about a year. This one's called a Reserva. And Reserva in Argentina means one, a minimum of one year aging in oak. We have Reservas here in America, or people call Reserves, and it has no legal standing. There's no defined legal uh, condition for calling your wine a reserve. There's a wine from California. I'm not going to mention the name, but it's about $4 and they call it a reserve. Now I'd say to myself, is that the best they could do for, you know, this is your top wine. It's a fruit. And, uh, but if you go to Italy, reserva actually means something. It's a written down law. Spain has a written down law. Argentina does. But here in America, if you put reserve on, it doesn't mean that it's your best wine. It just means it's whatever you're calling it. But uh, these wines have that, that little tannic grip. And the tannins do preserve a wine. A wine that has a high level of tannin is not so enjoyable young. But over a couple of years, the tannins resolve and they get a little softer. If you open up a wine and you feel that, that really drying sensation from the tannins, there's a good antidote. Cheese, fat, a nice ribeye steak. If you open up a Cabernet and maybe you should have decanted it and you didn't, and you're trying to drink it and it's really, well, you take a piece of cheese and try the cheese, the, the fat will kind of coat your mouth. Your next sip of the wine is going to go down way smoother. Uh, you may even get some flavors that you didn't notice before. A piece of beef, a ribeye steak that has a bit of fat, it complements it so well. It, the kind of the, the fat negates the tannins in some sense. Tannins actually bind with the proteins in your saliva, and that really, uh, that dries your mouth out. So uh, if you have any of those kind of wines, and it's always good to have something to eat with, uh, with, uh, with your wine. A nice little piece of cheese or some charcuterie or a little piece of beef or you know, shrimp if you're doing white wines. But uh, uh, 
Remember that next time you have wine, you go, oh, that really is a, that's a strong one. Take a piece of cheese, try it again. You might be surprised on, uh, on uh, how, it, how it seems to change there. So anybody have any particular uh, questions about either Malbec or something else? I'd be glad to, uh, to address them. So John, I'm, uh, if I'm drinking by myself, which doesn't happen a lot, but um, if I open up a bottle of wine, I can't finish it. How, how long is it good for in the fridge? How fast do I have to drink it? <laughs> well, uh, you know, the gag answer is, geez, that never happened to me. So I don't know. <laughs> but, but in reality, I've got a bottle of wine from last night pumped up right over there. Uh, okay. When, when, when you open up a bottle of wine, be honest, with you, the, the clock is ticking. Okay. What's going to happen is it's going to oxidize. Now, mm -hmm. the sulfite level in the wine will help a little bit. But it can't, it's not a cure-all. They, they don't put enough sulfite in to make the wine indestructible, and that's good. We don't need that much sulfites. So it depends on the wine. This wine here, this is a nice fruity wine. It's got a good acidity. The acidity will help the wine stay preserved for a little longer. If you have a wine that's been aged in oak, a white wine like a Chardonnay, that's already had some oxidation going. That might not last as long as this, but to be specific, a few days, you're going to start seeing a difference each day, just a little, you know, it's not like whoosh, one day it, it's gone, but you're going to see each day, oh, the next day, it, you know, not, not too bad at all. Next day, oh, it tastes pretty good still, the third day. But after that, you're going to start seeing a deterioration. It's going to start oxidizing, you know, and you get that nutty flavor. You know, think of an apple, how it turns brown. That's oxidation. Mm -hmm. So here's some, here's some suggestions that I have. One, even if you don't do anything else, even if it's red, Put it in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. Oxidation goes slower at cold temperatures, low temperatures. So put it in the refrigerator, and even if it's red, you just have to remember to take it out, you know, an hour before. If you want to go to the, what I tell people, get a half bottle, drink it. Usually it's dessert wines that you find in half bottles, but mm -hmm. you know, have a dessert wine or whatever. Drink your dessert wine. Rinse out the bottle. If you want to get really classy, scrape off the label, soak it off. And then when you don't finish a full bottle, pour it into here. And there's a couple ways you can go. If you can get it really full, put this, put a stopper like this. Okay. Or this is what I have over on the side on my counter there. These are uh, rubber stoppers that are made to go with the vacuum vents. Oh, and wow. Put that on here. And then you pump. And when it takes out all the air, it makes a clicking sound. And it actually removes the air. Now, wow. those are only short term things. You know, you can't say, you know, I did mine about four weeks ago. What do you think? <laughs> it's no good. Yeah. The, vac the vacuum you create here, you know, it doesn't last. It, right. So this is really just a, you know, an overnight or two things. It'll help. But if you have this pretty much filled with wine and you have no air in there and you use a filter stopper like this, that's just as effective because now there's no air. And to take it a step further, this is a single size. Oops, no, I advertise. Okay, I can handle that. <laughs> get a single size and same thing, put a stopper in it, get it to the top if you can. But even if you don't, the smaller the air space, mm -hmm. The better you are. So you don't want to do this. Lay it down because then you're going to have an airspace that goes like this. And if you get down to where you have less than this, if you have an ice cube tray, pour it in the tray, freeze it, uh -huh. put it in the bag, and the next time you want to make sauce, pull out a cube, and there you go. Oh, that's cool. I never thought of that. You want to, here's something I haven't tried. I haven't tried it yet. I know uh -huh. people, and there's, there's fancy wine writers who claim this works. They actually take the wine, leftover wine, and freeze it. Now, I've... Wow. <laughs> I know. I've heard of that. Then, then, you want to go further. Then, I've heard of some people saying, I put it in the microwave after. And, oh, my God. <laughs> okay. But if you ever do the freezing thing, if you were to freeze it, you have to remember that wine is mostly water. It's going to expand. Mm. And... Uh, and I've, I've been guilty of this. I've put wine in the freezer and forgot. And 
you know, I, I didn't mean to save it. I was just trying, I forgot to chill it. And it, it, it'll blow the bottle apart. The, the bottle will explode. Trust me. Right. <laughs> so if you do put wine in the freezer, leave room for expansion because it's water and it's going to expand as it freezes. So you know, it's mostly wine. Mm -hmm. But uh, so wine doesn't last forever. The heavier wines last longer. If you put a, you might get a really big red. The ones we were talking, you should be can't. Those can taste better the next day. They really. So can. I take it box wines aren't that great. They're better than they ever were. They really are. Really? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. The very first ones, they weren't so good. And there's even some right now you can buy if you don't look carefully. It says wine and other flavors. You know, it's a, it's not just a lot of wine. But there are, there's, a, you know, um, there's many producers. My best uh, thing to say is go to a wine shop that you've been going to and, and talk to the people and say, which ones do you suggest out of these? And you try it. And if the person gave you a good tip, then you know the person's onto it. If the wine was really horrible, you never talk with that guy again. Or that person, you know, you ask for a different, uh, but get to know somebody in a wine shop. They love that. People... You know, a lot of people come in and they don't even talk. You know, can I help you? And no, no, no. They're, they're, they're saying, oh, I, I would be glad to help. So get somebody that you trust. There are some good ones in the box. All right, now I don't feel that I should go out and start naming commercial products. But uh, if you sent me an email, I would. <laughs> but uh, uh, no, they're good. They don't last forever either, though. You can't, you can't go for th six months with a box of wine. So... Uh, the trick is uh, use it up and you know have a party, have somebody over. All right, any other questions? And then we'll move on to the last wine. We're, we're gonna keep, my, my pad keeps migrating. So, uh, all right. Well, we're gonna move over to wine number three that we, the category was Washington State uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. Now this has got a direct relation to the first wine. Cabernet Sauvignon, is actually the child of a cross between Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc. This didn't exist in the 1600s. This is, a, well, right around then, maybe is my king. It, nature crossed them, they, the pollen from one plant got onto the other, and you have a brand new grape created. And so when Cabernet Sauvignon was born, because Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc crossed. It's a much hardier grape than Cabernet Franc is. Well, that's a red grape. And uh, it has more tannins. This, this particular one, this one here, has the most tannins of all the, the, either of the two uh, uh, reds. And this one definitely is one that we enjoy it more with, uh, with uh, some cheese or something to eat. But Cabernet Sauvignon is one of the most popular wines in the world. And like I said, it, it originated in, in France. But now everybody grows it. You can find it anywhere. And it, again, it tastes from where it grows. If you grow this, Connecticut, for instance, we cannot grow Cabernet Sauvignon. Our growing season is too short. Uh, our, we get our killing frost before Cabernet Sauvignon fully ripens. However, Cabernet Franc will ripen for us, so we can use that. Uh, so if you get this from a cool climate, it's not going to have that big California flavors. I picked Washington because, believe it or not, Washington is far north as it is has uh, more hours of sunlight because of the northern latitudes than Napa Valley. And so they have you know, longer, longer days during the summer, longer nights, universally in the winter, but they can get your grapes really right. There's the Cascade Mountain Range, blocks the rain. So, you know, Seattle is very wet, but the mountains try to stop that. On the other side, you're gonna have deserts. And so it's a great place to grow grapes. And uh, their style is probably less fruity in California, but not as, austere as, uh, as some of the European ones. And uh, it makes a great wine if you like the hardy reds. And this is a really hardy red. It's a, uh, uh, this is definitely a wine for some food. Uh, when I taste this one, which I uh, you can see the difference in color. You can see Cabernet is a little more black purple, whereas the, the uh, the Malbec tend a little more in a red shade and completely different smell, black cherries, black currants, again, more oak. I can actually get a little bit of that oak, you know, where you get kind of a, a smoky uh, vanilla flavor, vanillins. Mm. 
Yep. Where's my cheese? <laughs> this one really, if you were just trying to enjoy this as just a cocktail wine, you would say, I don't know. But if you had this with a nice piece of cheese, even a piece of blue cheese, with some creamy cheese, you know, brie, something like that, uh, and it would taste the wine, even better is, is a piece of beef. I, we used to do dinners at the Jones Winery, and uh, the chef and I would occasionally be tasked with writing tasting notes. And we had a Merlot from California. They, they bought the grapes and made it in, in, uh, in Connecticut. And it, had, it was a great, it was a much heavier wine than we could grow here in Connecticut. And we tasted the wine first, and then we had a piece of beef with it. And it really expanded the flavors of the wine. We could really get the black cherries and the black currant flavors, which you can, they can kind of sometimes share. So I really advise, you know, pairing up your wines with, uh, with some food because it's, uh, to me, they just go together. You know, it's, uh, there's an old saying, whatever grows together, goes together. And, you know, in, in Tuscany, you get the Sangiovese grape, and there's a lot of tomato-based dishes, and they go just so great together. You know, other countries have the wines that grow alongside, and somehow they have an affinity for each other. Uh, quickly, I'll mention this. Uh, this is from a company called Columbia Crest. And I don't normally try to get wines from huge, huge producers, which this is. These guys also own Chateau St. Michel. You've probably heard that, uh, a producer from Washington State. And I have to say for both of them, uh, they're, they're reasonably priced and they're always reliable. They, 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 they have a whole line of wines. You can get one starting at about $8, go to 10 go to 15 and go up. So they have one for every price range and every taste. And they make very reliable wines and, and they're always on but they are big production, but you know, what's wrong with that? If they can make, it's hard to get a great wine for $10 in America from California grapes. So Washington state, if they have a big production, you know, with the scale of the volume they have, they can keep the cost down. So uh, don't be afraid of some of those guys. So anybody uh, want to have any other questions that I can uh, address? Uh, Anybody have anything to ask John? Well, I, I have something, John. Um, oh. It has to do with wine, ta uh, wine tastings. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I remember a while back being at one and there was some mention of attendees not, um, that they shouldn't wear any kind of perfume or cologne. Is that a thing? And, it is. and why? When when you think about most of the information that we get about tasting really comes from our nose. And uh, if somebody has some really powerful scents on cologne or perfume and they come near you, you're going to smell that your, your, your whole, that's why you're going to smell. And, and I've seen this happen to me firsthand. I've been to some tastings and all of a sudden I start going, I can't smell anything. And then, and then you start realizing somebody standing near you has some really powerful fragrance on and that's all you can smell. You can't smell, you can't, you can't even taste the wine. You have to like go away for a while, have some water, eat something. You got to get that, get that, uh, you know, out of your nose. So uh, as much as it might be a nice fragrance for someone to wear, if you bring that to a wine tasting, most people are going to be very disappointed. <laughs> it's a, it really, it's like a buzzkill. It, 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 it takes over. It really does. I thought I saw a green thing there, but, uh, uh, anyways, uh, yeah, it's it's same with cigarette smoke. You know, if there's a lot of cigarette smoke around and you're trying to enjoy a, a smell of wine, and you're, you're all you're getting is the cigarette smoke, it's uh, doesn't work. It really doesn't work. So, uh, you know, make sure that uh, you have to go fragrance free if you go to a tasting. Fragrance free, okay. I had never heard that before, and then I I had mm -hmm. overheard it, and I thought, oh, okay, that's interesting. It is just it's like if you go into a freshly painted room and you really get that you know the smell of paint, and it stays with you for a while, and uh, it, it 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 interferes with your enjoyment of what's what you're trying to taste and what you're trying to smell. So, you know, it's uh, you know it's like if somebody in the office cooks uh, microwaves fish from two days ago, and they'll get that smell in the whole thing. And that's all you can you try to eat your lunch, and that's all you smell is. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. But the same thing with uh, with fragrances there. So, uh, 
I'll, I'll leave you with maybe one one last uh, thing. Let me uh, get a quick for a second. Okay. So to go back to the screw caps, and, and you know the industry likes to call them twist offs. It sounds nicer, I guess. But, uh, but what happened was, you know, cork is a natural product. It comes from a tree. There's a cork oak. It grows mainly in uh, Portugal, Spain, some parts of North Africa. And uh, they strip the bark off the tree. When the tree is a certain age, they can strip the bark off. It's, it's sustainable. So many years later, they can do it again. And this can go on for hundreds of years or more. And so they strip the bark off. It gets processed. They dry it, and it gets processed. And one of the processes would be with some chlorine. And it turns out that there can be compounds or organisms in the cork, in the natural bark, that react with the chlorine treatment. And they create a compound called TCA, trichloroanisole. There's some numbers, 246. And in tiny little amounts, it just robs the flavor of the, uh, the wine, or the, the aromas. And so you might have a bottle of wine that you, you're familiar with, and you taste it, and you go, gee, that don't taste much. Or maybe I have a cold. I can't taste anything. Who knows? And then three weeks later, you try the wine again, a different, different, you know, fresh bottle. And you taste it, and you go, gee, it tastes just fine. Well, it could have been the cork that stole the flavors because a little bit of that TCA compound can mute the aromas and taste. In a little bit higher percentages, the TCA can actually impart a, uh, a, a smell and flavor of uh, wet basements. Cart, you know, like, you ever smell wet cardboard or wet basement or wet newspaper? Uh. And uh, unfortunately, the cork industry doesn't like to talk about it, but you know, there are times people would say at least 5% of all the corks had that default, that was that fault in it. And what other industry would, would live with a 5% failure rate? So if this was in your wine and you had a high level of TCA, you to take, you're not going to enjoy it. It won't make you sick. You're just going to go, I don't want it. And the, the industry term for that is corked. And you smell that wet basement thing and it, it's, you call it corked. So if you get that, put it right back in the bottle, bring it back to the store and say, hey, this wine's corked. Could I replace it? And they should give it to you. They give it back to the distributor. If they don't, then I wouldn't go back there again. But unfortunately, it doesn't do anything for you if you don't have a backup bottle at night for, uh, for your guests. But because of this cork taint, created the rise for screw caps. And so, you, 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 not that you could never get this, this cork taint, this, this TCA could be in the winery. It could be in the barrels. And so it could translate into a wine cap with a screw cap, but not so much. So, uh, that's why we see the, the proliferation of screw caps in, in wines that don't need to be aged. You know, most of those wines don't need to be aged for uh, 10 years like a port does or a Barolo. Or, so uh, when you get your wine delivered, if you order a wine at a restaurant, you know, they often sometimes offer you the cork. Now there's a mixed opinion. Should you smell the cork? I do. And if I could smell that musty smell on the cork, then chances are the wine might have it too. But you really got the proof is in the wine, so give it a good smell. And back in the old days, wine wasn't in bottles, it was in, in barrels. Yeah. And, uh, question? Yes, John? Yes. What about plastic corks? And then my second question is, what about how you hold the wine glass? Mm -hmm. I'll do the wine glass first. I go by the stem, unless my wine is a white wine that's so icy cold that I can't taste it. Then I do this. Normally, I don't like to have fingerprints all over my glass, and I don't want to warm it up, so I'll hold it by the stem. But uh, so that—that's—that's that's really why. But you know, you go to certain, you go to Italy, you go to a place for lunch, they'll often just hand you a tumbler, you know, and you drink it out of. You know, it tastes pretty good still. It, uh, it doesn't hurt, but uh, I like to use this uh, the, the stem simply just because of the fingerprint thing and warming it up. Sometimes if the wine is too cold, you have to warm it up. As far as plastic corks, uh, I, have, I have mixed feelings about them. They do seem to protect the wine. I've heard people say they can sometimes taste plastic in wine. That's, I've never had that experience. Uh, what I'm not so crazy about, I guess, though, is they're so darn hard to get back in the bottle if you uh, try to recork it with, uh, with the plastic. You know, it seems to expand. So then you definitely need to have another, uh, all, you know, another, stopper if you're not going to finish the wine.
but uh, and some of them aren't recyclable. Cork used to be. I mean, Whole Foods used to take in corks you could recycle them. But I don't know if they do that anymore. But uh, so yeah, cork. There, there's an amazing number of alternative closures now. Some are uh, the plastic. Some are kind of rubberized. Some are they, they use uh, de, you know biodegradable uh, fibers. So there's a whole raft of uh, different closures now, simply again because of that cork taint. And that cork taint still does exist in, in some wines. So, uh, but yeah, that's thanks for that question. It's uh, have you ever tried putting one of those plastic corks back in? They're no. they're they're hard. They're very very difficult. But uh, the, uh, the they they've gotten better. Corks. The, the you know they even have TCA sniffing dogs now, where they bring them into the winery, and they can actually go and sniff out if there's any of that taint in their barrels. And, uh, in their cork and things like that, and so they of course worked on it. It's it's much less, but it used to be if you uh, if you opened up a case of the same wine at a big tasting, you could guarantee one of them was going to be corked. And, uh, it's not so bad anymore. But uh, uh, yeah, so uh, anybody else have a comment or a question or something that's been? Uh, what about Chardonnay? Oh. Oh. Sorry, Jen. Uh -huh. What about rosé? Wine. I love them. Uh, you know, rosés are a great you wine. Any? Uh, it's particular bottlings. Well, if you like to spend about seventeen dollars, I know that's a lot. My favorite is from from Italy called La Spinetta. And you can't miss it because it has a rhinoceros on the front or hippopotamus. I forget which. You know. But it's a delicious, delicious. But there's many, you know, even more affordable rosés, and. Uh, they're just kind of like the bridge between white and red, and they're they chilled, and uh, uh, I think they're a great wine. They're, they're, you know, I like to have them all year round. A lot of people only have them in the summer, uh, but there's uh, there's a lot of great rosés. Uh, one one of the most famous ones now is from Long Island, and uh, you know they have uh, there's one called Wolfer Estate in Long Island, and they make one called uh, Wolfer Estate Rosé. That's delicious. It really is. That's a great one. There's so many good ones, uh, but again, ask you at your wine shop. You know, there's so many. There's, it's hard to pick one to to say uh, try that one. But ask at your wine shops. But tell them what you like. If you say you like a little fruitier wine, or you don't like it as dry, or you know, you have to give them some hints, and, uh, and they can match you up. And then the next time you go back, they ask you how it was. You say, well, it was too dry for me, or it wasn't fruity. You know, you can, and, and they'll fine tune your. Uh, their suggestions for you, but yeah, I, I love them. They're uh, they're great, great with salmon, great with uh, vegetable dishes, things like that. Or just just a sip, you know. Thanks. All right, John. So I have another question. Sure. So, um, what's the advantage of having different wine? Compared to uh, white wines versus red wines, the different different shape of the glasses. You mean? Yes, please. Well, <clears throat> depending on who you talk to, some will say that different shapes enhance certain wines more than other shapes. I pretty much go for a standard one. I like, like if you can see, this is kind of like a tulip shape where it's narrower at the top than it is at the bottom, and that's why I look for that in there. I've been to places where they give you the same wine out of two different glasses. And I'll have to say, there were times when I would go, you know, it does seem different in, in this particular glass. So I'll have to say that it does seem that sometimes there can be uh, some advantages to having a different shape of a glass when that's made for that particular varietal, like your Chardonnay glasses, Pinot Noir glasses. And, and uh, I don't know. My my feeling is uh, they taste pretty good out of most anything. Like I said, a, a, trum, a tumbler. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of the stemless glasses too. You know, that people use, and you do have to hold those and all. But uh, I think I don't. I just basically have a little smaller one for say reds, and a little bigger one with a bigger bowl for excuse me for what for the whites, and a bigger one for the reds. But uh, I don't even use champagne flutes anymore. I like to put them in a regular glass and give it a good. Give it a good smell. It's just like those flutes are so so petite. You know, it's like you know a little hard to to get my nose in there. So, 
but yeah, I do think sometimes the shape can have an effect on the, the smell and the taste. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. So anyways, if uh, uh, you have a question, if you have any questions, if you have a wine emergency, send me an email and I'll say, oh my God, I'm serving artichokes. What kind of wine should I have? Sauvignon Blanc. But if you have a question, you think of something later, my email is info at wineunwrapped.com. And I'd be more than happy to just say, oh, we were at the uh, Newington Library uh, Zoom and I had a question I forgot to ask you. And I'll be very happy to, uh, to get back to you. So uh, feel free to reach out and uh, yeah, you know, keep opening bottles, keep trying different things. and. Uh, Keep supporting the library folks here because uh, they put this on for it. Anybody have any, any last uh, questions or anything? Can you talk about the health benefits of red versus white and the sugar content? Well, the sugar content really is a measure of dryness. And all the wines that we had, uh, that I have on my table here, would be considered dry wines. That means that they let the yeast ferment all the sugar to completion. And what, when, when yeast ferment sugar, they turn it into carbon dioxide and alcohol. The riper the grape, the higher the alcohol content will eventually become. Red and whites, there's really not a big difference in the sugar content. They're, they're going to have, so it's a question of how, how ripe did you pick the grape? If you pick the grape really early, uh, it's not going to have a high sugar content. It's going to have low alcohol. If you pick it, really let it hang, you're going to have some... Uh, to be honest with you, I bought some grapes. I make wine at home. This past year, I bought grapes. I bought Zinfandel grapes. The, when I measured the sugar content on them, it was so high that the alcohol, if it fermented all the way, the alcohol level would have got so high, it would have killed the yeast. I had to water the wine down. So the alcohol level is really just a measure of how much sugar in. And most of these wines are, are pretty much dry. There are a bunch of wines on the market, like uh, some of the red blends and things. They leave them just a little bit sweet. So the question of how much sugar is in the wine is up to the winemaker. And uh, the, the, the bulk of the wines are, are, are dry, but you can leave just a little bit of sugar. Uh, the German Rieslings, they leave some sugar uh, in some of their wines to, to make it there. There was a thing in uh, 60 Minutes many years ago about the health benefits of resveratrol, a compound that's in wines, but uh, it, it, they called it the French paradox because many of the French were Know, seemingly fit, but they had a lifestyle that you wouldn't think that would happen. And uh, they blamed it, or they, caused, they said it was caused by, we're drinking red wine. And that made a big red wine surge in, in America. But truthfully, you'd have to drink, you'd have to have so much resveratrol that it wouldn't, it's, it wouldn't be healthy for you to drink that much wine to get the resveratrol. So they say, you know, moderation is good. And uh, in moderate amounts, it can be uh, beneficial. So, thank you, John. Bye -bye. Jen, did you have a question? As well? I did. Yeah. Um, so I I have done this many times where I think I'm going to drink a bottle of wine, so I put it in the fridge, and then I don't, and it takes up space, so I take it out. And it goes back up to room temperature. It's not open. I don't open it. Is that okay, or am I committing a horrible crime? Oh, I, I've done that too, and I don't think I find okay. any, any ill effects really. Uh, okay, so it can know. go from room temperature to cold back to room temperature. It happens, you know. And okay. you know, here's something people don't even think about. When you think about in the winter the delivery of uh, wine and beer uh, to to shops, you know they load up the truck in the morning. Some, mm -hmm. some stores are the last delivery. You know, and if it's 15 degrees out, what do you think's happening to all that wine and beer? It's getting really chilled. And then it gets delivered. Okay. To me, the worst thing that would be is really the opposite. If it's on the truck in the summer all day, mm -hmm. and then it gets heated to 9,500, 500, the, the wine is actually going to expand and it can start pushing the cork out or it can, it can make the wine okay. material. But... If it goes to the refrigerator and that, you know, I don't, I haven't, haven't had any problems with that. Oh, that's what I like to hear. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
you say, ah, I'm not going to have it now. Oh. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But once it's opened, that's different. Yes, exactly. Yeah, once it's opened. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Well, anybody else have anything? If not, then I'm going to wrap up and say, uh, well, I want to say thank you for having me here, and uh, I hope I was able to enlighten something in, in you about uh, wine and make you think about having it with something else too, by the way. And uh, there's, a, there's a little saying that I like to say is, uh, uh, there's, water separates the people of the world, but viruses also separate the people of the world, but wine brings us together. So it was nice to meet you all because of the, right. the wine connection. And uh, thank you for, uh, for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This was great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Very informative. Thank you. Thanks, Karen and John and Jennifer. I'm You're glad welcome. you came, everyone. I'm glad you came. You all. Everybody take care. Bye-bye. Enjoy you. your wine. <laughs> <laughs> Keep swirling. Keep swirling, yes. Bye-bye, <laughs> everybody. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.